I feel that today in Armenia, there's plenty of job opportunities. I feel that you also shouldn't wait around for an opportunity to come by. Maybe it's time to create an opportunity. Today we are here with the amazing Tammy Avakian, who is the CEO of uh, Girls of Armenia Leadership Soccer, aka Goals. Uh, Tammy, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. So uh, let's start with your background, your biography, where you were born, where you were raised, and uh, what brought you to Armenia. Um, it's a little bit of a long story. Um, and I always, get asked this, I always get asked this question, where are you from? And I find it a little bit difficult to answer because at this point I've lived in so many places and mm -hmm. I'm from everywhere really. <laughs> um, but I was born in Iran. I was born in Tehran. So yes, I am Farskahai. Um, Post-revolution, my family decided to move to the U.S. Um, so I grew up in Boston, Massachusetts. In 96, my parents decided that we're Armenian and therefore we should be living in Armenia. So we packed up and moved to Armenia. Now, 96 in Armenia was not an easy time. It was, it was very difficult, especially for a teenage girl um, from the U.S., you know, brought up with uh, Western views of everything to be brought to Armenia and dropped in the middle of not a great sort of situation. Um, there was a great lack of water, you know, electricity was an issue. Stores weren't necessarily stocked up with everything. Um, and just the culture shock that I had when, when we moved here. Um, one of the most difficult things was having to go to school in Armenian. Um, but, you know, these are challenges that are overcomable so it's not impossible to to make that transition if i could do it in 96 i feel like any kid could do it now um you know i finished my high school here uh, i went to university here um, i went to yerevan state university um, got my bachelor's degree and i was like all right well i did my P you know i did my time in armenia thank you very much so i'm leaving um, so I left. I left to, to go do my master's abroad. Um, I did a year in Paris and then my second year in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, throughout that time, I, you know, met my husband. We got married. We came back to Armenia. We got married and moved to the U.S. So this time, California. I lived in California for three years. Fresno. Yeah. Don't ask. <laughs> Como for me. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, but, you know, after five years of being away from Armenia, I remember one specific day. I was, I was talking to my mom on the phone. Um, she was here in Armenia at the time. And I was like, Mom, you know, I feel like I can't complain. You know, I have a great job. We have a house. My son was born at that time. Like... I can't complain about anything at this moment in time, but I feel like I'm wasting time and wasting my life being here. Um, I felt like I wasn't making an impact. I felt like I wasn't contributing all I could. I wasn't able to give back to the community as much as I wanted to. Um, that's when the recession hit the U.S. and I remember having a conversation with my husband and I was like, listen, not plan A, not plan B, but like plan F. What if we decide to move back to Armenia? Um, plan F became plan A very quickly. And within two months, we packed up and moved uh, to Armenia. It's been 
I think 12 years now, 11, 12 years now that we've been back and it's been amazing. Like I really think that that was one of the best decisions that we could have made. Um, you know, people ask me, oh, you moved, you know, from the U.S. to Armenia. Why did you do that? You know, wasn't it good in the U.S.? Didn't you, you know, didn't you like it there? Yes, I liked it there. Yes, it was great. But I feel like I, a better version of myself here. Mm -hmm. I feel like I have more to offer here. Um, so, you know, may, it's, maybe it's not for everyone, but it definitely was for me and my family. Sure. So um, walk us through uh, what you did in Armenia since you came. So I know that you worked in Fitch for Armenia for, for a while. So can you tell us a bit um, more about what you did there? Before I get to Teach for Armenia, I want to tell you how I made my transition into the sure. nonprofit um, sure. sphere. Um, I come from a very corporate background. I, you know, worked in marketing and sales in the U.S. And then when I when we moved back here, I worked in telecommunications. I did product development and marketing, um, both on the wholesale and re uh, retail side. And, you know, I very much enjoy the, the discipline of the corporate world. Um, after telecommunications, I transitioned to an IT company. And again, no complaints. Like, IT is great. It's a fun atmosphere, especially in Armenia with all the startups. But I felt like there was something missing. I loved what I did. I just didn't have purpose. Um, so that's when I had a chance encounter through a mutual acquaintance with the founder and CEO of Teach for Armenia. Um, and, you know, I think it was like one conversation over coffee and we knew that we clicked and it worked. And she had the vision and the, the discipline and, you know, everything that it takes to set up a new organization. And I love that I get to be working in a disciplined environment, but at the same time for the greater good. Um, education is very important, not only to Armenia, but for you know all countries across the world. But I think in our case, being such a small country, it's especially important for us. And unfortunately, a lot of kids were being left out of a getting a proper education. Um, they were being deprived of a basic human right and Teach for Armenia was the organization that filled that gap. Um, I was lucky to start a Teach for Armenia as the head of recruitment and selection. So I got to really, you know, get to know the potential of this country. I got to really you know, go out there, not only in Yerevan, but to all of the regions for recruitment purposes to see what we have as a, you know, youth. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, pick the best that I could to send them to teach in schools. Um, the great thing about Teach for Armenia is it's not only for locals, it's also for diaspora. So highly encourage the diaspora to take two years out of their time to come to Armenia to give back. So this is the part where it's not, you know, if living in Armenia isn't for you, then maybe teach for Armenia is, because you get to, you know, really immerse yourself into the full Armenia experience, because you're not going to be in Yerevan, you're going to be in proper, Armenia proper. Um, you're gonna, you know, live with the problems that your, your, your fellow villagers have, you're gonna, you know, get excited when some one of your kids gets accepted to college. You're going to, you know, become sad when something goes wrong. You're going to really have that true experience of what it is to be in Armenia. Um, and, you know, what a few years uh, in, I also got the opportunity to um, lead the, the program side of Teach for Armenia. So I was responsible from basically A to Z. Um, in terms of the program um, elements. So from recruitment all the way through alumni. And it's really, you know, it was a privilege to see how we were able to develop 
um, the talent that we have uh, both locally and from the diaspora to truly become uh, amazing role models for, for the kids in Armenia. Because it's really not just about giving them, you know, book smarts. Today, in this day and age, and this is my personal opinion, um, the functionality of a school has changed. If in previous times, school was where you would get knowledge and information, today we have the internet. Today, every single kid probably knows more than, you know, or can have access to more knowledge than, you know, any teacher is able to give them. So I think the, the functionality of the school as, a, as an institution and teachers as, as, you know, persons who are interacting with kids the majority of the day, they need to have a mindset shift as to what their role is. Um, I think they need to shift into more, per, you know, teaching these kids how to use the knowledge that's easily accessible what that can give them in the future. So, and, and soft skills, which we greatly lack in this country. <laughs> right. So, um, moving on to your current and uh, very important uh, project, Goals. So, uh, can you please tell us more about Goals and how you founded it and how it became about? So, Goals was founded in 2016. Um, and it came about as um, a result of a few conversations between one of our board members and the um, ambassador at the time um, and a few Peace Corps uh, volunteers. Um, I don't think that it's a secret that there is, you know, um, gender inequality uh, all across the world, but more so in Armenia and especially in, in rural Armenia. Um, the role of women first and foremost is, you know, mother, caregiver, uh, homemaker, um, which is fine. We, you know, as an organization, we do not intend to, uh, we're not here to dictate what is right or wrong. Um, we're here to present alternate possible Your futures. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so we, you know, thought, how can we get access to the girls of rural Armenia, make it fun, make it healthy, and, you know, give them something to do outside of their normal routine. Um, and we thought about sports and now sports is great because everyone loves to play a game and everyone loves to play sports, but we specifically chose, um, soccer or football, as we say here, um, because it's mostly a predominantly male sport. So, but at the same time, it's also very easy or more easy to organize because all you really need is a field and a ball and you can you know, managed to, to put together something. Um, so goals came about with the purpose to provide a safe space for girls in rural Armenia to teach them a sport, but at the same time, teach them leadership through sports. So all our activities are purposeful. All of our, um, the games that we do during practice have a teaching component. Um, and we make sure that, you know, the girls are respected, the, you know, our coaches treat them with dignity. Um, it's very important that they feel like they are important, they are relevant and, and they have a voice. Um, it's very interesting to see, you know, when a girl first joins one of our teams, they're usually very timid, don't speak up much. Um, but within a few days, within a few weeks, you can see the transition happening. And, you know, these girls turn into like warriors out on the field. And it's amazing to see. 
Մեզ այցելել են կրկնակի ոլիմպիական չեմպյոն Հուտի բոլտն է և կրկնակի WNBA չեմպյոն շերի սեմը։ Նրանք երկոր կանցկասնեն գյումրիում, կմարձվ են երեխաների հետ, երորդ որը կլինի երևանում միջոցարում, արդեն մարզիշների հետ, որտեղ նրանք մարզիշներին կկարթան տասախոսություն, կապված WNBA-ի հետ, իշպես կարլի հաստել այն տեղ։ Եթե ես պարմունքները չլինենել, մենք շատ վաժություններ արդենք կաղող ենք մեր մտքում պահել ու այս վաժությունները կկիրարենք ամբողջ պարմունքների ընթացքում, որպիսի կարողանանք լապ խաղալ։ And I remember one day I went to one of our games in um, Suranavan and the entire village had come out to cheer on the girls play from, you know, two year old little kids to Datiks and Papiks. They were all out there cheering for girls. Now I know that that's an uncommon sight in Armenia. It's uncommon to see communities come together to support their girls in doing something that's not traditionally the role or function of a female. Um, and I think that, you know, their peers growing up, seeing them in this role is really going to impact how they are, you know, how we evolve as, um, a nation. I think that if our, you know, young men and boys see their, you know, the girls as counter equal counterparts, um, subconsciously and indirectly, they are already being impacted. They're already, um, you know, viewing them as equals, whether they want to or not. Yeah. And I think that. In the long run, that's the, the true impact that we're going to be seeing. Um, obviously, with the direct impact of empowering our girls to have a voice, to possibly make alternate life choices, um, to possibly have a career in uh, sports, because some of them are truly talented. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you for that. So. Um talking about change and um, obviously there's been discrimination, structural discrimination, especially, I mean, for this topic, let's talk about football. When, for example, in 2013, the Football Federation of Armenia, the FFA, disbanded the women's program. So, and now through all the work you're doing, you, you've been doing, you're saying that you see positive changes in communities where all, all the village comes out to support. So what do you think is the greater or macro uh, change that um, your programs can change, not just in football, but as a, as a society as a whole? Yeah, it was, it was uh, very interesting. Um, back in the day when uh, they decided that we no longer needed a you know, female or women's uh, team. But I think, first and foremost, I want to say that Goals um, works with the Football Federation of Armenia very closely. Um, um, we have a very great relationship with them and they are very much um, encouraging the work that Goals does in, in uh, rural communities. We're also, um, like one of the only pipelines of talent um, from rural Armenia for the you know future um, women's teams, uh, national teams um, in Armenia, um, and I'm proud to say that we do have several girls playing in the under 17 and under 19 teams, and it's you know it's amazing to see that there is a possibility and there is a pathway for you know some girl from the village of you know, middle of nowhere, it's unique to, to be on the national women's team. And I think that's, that's amazing to see. Um, 
through the work that we did with uh, the Football Federation of Armenia and our counterparts, um, the women's team has been relaunched. Um, right now, there is the under 17, the under 19s, and the national, um, like the senior uh, women's team. Um, there was a recent law that passed or guideline within the guidelines of um, football that all uh, professional men's teams, in order for them to qualify, must also have a women's team. So now all um, of the sports clubs must also have a women's team um, in order for them to be allowed to play. Um, which I think is a success. I mean, it's sort of forcing uh, people in the direction that we want to be going into, but I think with time, they will see that there's also value in that. So it's not just uh, there for, you know, putting a check mark. Um, and I know that you know, with the cooperation or partnership with the Football Federation, we're Goals specifically is looking to um, engage younger and younger uh, girls um, starting from this September. I know the pandemic and the virus has put a little bit of a pause on things, but we're looking to restart, relaunch our um, activities this fall. And we're going to you know, have girls as young as eight years old um, join us on the field. Oh, that's great to hear. So uh, you're a volunteer, non-profit organization, so um, obviously in, there must be a lot of costs associated with all this, so where do you get your funding and uh, who are the benefactors of this program? So we um, we are a non-profit, Goals is a non-profit organization. Um, we function with uh, generous donations of both individual donors and uh, foundations and grants. Mm -hmm. um, we, so the way that we work is um, our coaches, and we have over 60 teams at this time in eight regions, our coaches are volunteers. So we don't have a cost associated with organizing the games itself in terms of paying coaches, but we do have costs associated with making sure the girls have the proper uniform and attire, um, making sure that if we're, you know, taking them on a away game, that we're feeding them along the way, um, transportation costs, um, medical kits, nurses, like we make sure that we have everything um, to create a safe environment uh, for the girls. Um, so they all, but they also need to, you know, have the proper attire. So those are the cost, the majority of the costs that are associated with the program itself. We're lucky to have an amazing board that has the connections and the network and the generosity to support um, what we do. Um, and I think that with us being a sports organization, it's something that you know even a little mom and pop shop in you know Glendale, California would want to sponsor a team or, or be part of. So if someone wants to you know contribute, they can mm -hmm. and their dime will make a difference. So a very important question, obviously uh, you are a very exemplary repa. Let's come back to Armenia from the US and twice. Twice. <laughs> and, uh, You've had such great impact uh, on our country. So what would you say to Armenians living abroad who have not visited Armenia or have not thought about moving to Armenia long term, who say maybe there, there is not enough job, job opportunities or the salaries are not too high or there is uh, societal problems, this, that. So well, what, what's your advice to them? I think that I feel that today in Armenia there's plenty of job opportunities. I feel that you also shouldn't wait around for an opportunity to come by. Maybe it's time to create an opportunity. Um, I think that you know if we're talking about salaries and living costs, um, yes, salaries in Armenia are not what they could be in the Western world. But at the same time, your living costs are 
much lower here. So I think overall quality of life, what you're getting for your dollar is definitely uh, greater here. Um, and I, I can personally say that, you know, the lifestyle that I have here in Armenia, it, I prefer it to, to the U.S. Um, and I especially think that it's a great place for kids. It's, just, you know, there are, there are societal issues, but those, that exists everywhere. But it is a safe place. I feel, you know, they say it takes a village to raise a child. I feel like Armenia is my village. There's so many benefits of having my children grow up here um, that I couldn't give them anywhere else. For example. Um, that sense of community, sense of family, sense of um, belonging. Um, those are those are things that I would have to like force teach if we were elsewhere. But here it comes naturally. So I can put my energies towards <laughs> something yeah. else. Um, what would I say to diaspora Armenians who haven't visited, who don't think that this is for them? That's okay. I don't think that, you know, Armenia is for everyone. But I do think that as an Armenian, as a diaspora Armenian, we have an obligation to, to give back. We have an obligation to, to do our part. Mm -hmm. um, whether that be, you know, through donating to local NGOs in Armenia or volunteering through Birthright or ABC or, you know, whatever you feel comfortable with. I feel like that, you know, this country is so small and but there's so many of us around the world that if we come together and truly make an effort, we can make this country an amazing place. Thank you very much, Penny, for this amazing uh, interview. You were so insightful about everything, about uh, the issues that we face as a country and um, uh, how to look into a brighter future. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us at Faces of Armenia. It was truly our honor and pleasure to have you here today. It's been amazing. Um, I do want to quick give a quick shout out. Um, if you guys haven't heard of Goals, um, and if you want to learn more, don't forget to check out our website at goalsarmenia.org and follow us on social media. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you very much again. And uh, don't forget about what she said. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.